Hello, I'm Ray Richardson from Simularity, and as Nick mentioned, this uh, talk is on practical predictive analytics on time series data. Now, probably the most important thing out of that title is practical, because the technique that I'll be talking about, we have deployed on very small devices, and in fact have done a, a prototype implementation on a device with only 2K of RAM. So this is a technique for analyzing time series at the sensor level. Now, when we talk about analyzing time series, mostly what we want to do is find anomalies. And anomalies have been misrepresented in the past, that sometimes people think of anomalies as outliers. And we're not looking for outliers, we're looking for unusual subsequences in the time series. And unusual means improbable. Now, this creates a problem because probability is not defined for time series. And uh, as, we, as we think about time series in a subsequence, it's kind of difficult to wrap your mind around how you would think of a time series as being likely or unlikely. Um, but fortunately, probability can be defined for certain types of symbols. And so mapping that time series subsequence to a symbol can allow us to assign a probability to the subsequence. And so this involves, this means we need an algorithm for mapping that time series to a symbol. First, we need a very special kind of symbol because as some of you probably astutely noticed, everything in a computer is a symbol. Everything's comprised of bytes, bytes are symbols. Um, all of the data structures that we use are symbolic. And uh, anomaly detection requires a very special kind of symbol. Uh, it requires a symbol that's drawn from a finite symbol space. And this just means that it's drawn from a fixed set of possible symbols. And so our algorithm for matching time series to symbols must draw that symbol out of a fixed set. And when we do that, we might be able to define a probability for what the occurrence is of that symbol, and hence the occurrence of the, of the time series subsequence. Finite symbol spaces for our purposes. Will cons are defined by two attributes, uh, an alphabet and, and some set of components which consist of elements of that alphabet. Um, and so if we had an alphabet of A through D and a length of four, A, B, C, D might be a legitimate symbol drawn from that set. And there are other ways to do it. It doesn't have to be so simply ordered. You can think of the uh, row and column of a matrix or even higher order structures as being a symbol which represents a component in there. And we'll talk about how some of the methods of creating symbols generate these rows and columns that represent the symbol. And of course, the finite, the finite space is simply the size of the matrix as long as the size of the matrix is constant. Um, What's interesting and, and sometimes applicable is that fixed point numbers drawn from a finite symbol space are, are, are drawn from a finite symbol space if they have a lower and upper bound, which if they're practically implemented, they must. Now, there's another attribute of the finite symbol space that we, for practical purposes, want to consider, and that is that it be relatively small. We don't want a finite symbol space consisting of millions or billions of possible symbols. We want hundreds or perhaps thousands and no more than that because we want to be able to deal with practical probabilities that we can actually use in, in analysis. Now a finite symbol space allows us to compute a perhaps naive probability of seeing a particular symbol. Now you can think of the of the finite symbol space as a sack of symbols, of all the possible symbols that exist in the space. And if I draw one out, I can think of it as a probability that I drew a particular set out. Now, it may be naive because my algorithm may not generate every possible symbol in the space. Uh, and an example is one of the techniques we described today 
might never generate the symbol AAAA. It might always generate BBBB. They, that flat symbol is the same for any representation, and it might only generate one of those. And so the probability is not exactly the reciprocal of the size of the, of, of the finite symbol space, but it's close. And this is important because when we're analyzing anomalies, we want to know whether something is very normal or very abnormal. Things that are close to normal, we don't care about. We only care about things that are seen very much of the time or very few of the time, not in the middle. And it, it's easy to compute the probability of seeing a symbol given our stack of symbols. It's the reciprocal of the size of the symbol space. Which takes us to time series. A time series is a sequence of pairs that's an, a time index and a value, but it's also an infinite series. It has some fixed beginning in time, but at least in principle, we should be able to continue getting readings on our time series from our sensors or other sources of time series data infinitely. And uh, we're not, we can't really compute anything about the infinite time series, but we can talk about subsequences or windows that are fixed boundaries between it that have a particular time span between them. It's the distance between two time indices. So I might think of a two hour time window that begins at four o'clock. And uh, these windows for purposes of our analysis here can be any length of time. If I'm analyzing, as in an example we'll give later on, the, the, the um, failure of hard drives, that I'm only getting a reading every two hours or so. So the time span of my window might be days. Whereas if I'm looking at an EKG, the time span is seconds. Uh, this technique works regardless of what the time span is. And what we do is we represent the window as a symbol. And because symbols in finite symbol space have a probability, we can think of the probability of the time series window. Now, when we talk about these symbols, especially ones that can be represented in symbol spaces that are relatively small, being able to convert my symbol to an integer is important for the practical representation of the maps that we use to compute these things. Once I have a time series, I have to normalize it. Um, as I mentioned before, a time series is, a, is a, a sequence of pairs. It's a time index and a value. And those time indices are not always equally spaced in time. Sometimes they are. And if they are, then that's good. But what I need to do is I need to first divide my time series into a fixed number of values that I can think of as being data boxes. Uh, this representation is called the piecewise aggregate approximation. And what it involves is averaging the readings of the time series over various subsequences of time in the time series window. So that in the, in the picture that I have here, the, the, the readings between minus 10 and minus 9 minutes are all averaged together. The readings between minus 9 and minus 8 are all averaged together to create 10 data boxes, which, which we will use by one of these techniques to create a symbol of length 10. And each value is no more, no less than the, the average of the values that go in the box. Now once I've got my time series normalized, I can think about a symbolic representation of the time series. And there are a number of algorithms that exist that represent time series as symbols in a finite symbol space. And we, we, we've all met these things before. We call them feature reducers or feature extractors. And self-organizing maps ha are one of these that have been around for 30 years. And we'll talk about how self-organizing maps can be used for this matter. But first we'll talk about SACS, the symbolic aggregate approximation, which is a symbolic methodology which was designed for time series. Now, before I continue, there are a lot of other ways to reduce time series to symbols. Um, possibly an infinite number of ways. Um, 
And as long as the, the symbol that's created it reduces to a, is, is a member of a finite symbol space, and as long as that finite symbol space is relatively small, say hundreds or thousands, then this technique will work. What is SACS? As I mentioned, it's a methodology for reducing a time series window to a symbol. It was developed at the University of California at Riverside by Dr. Eamon Kyo and a team of graduate students in the, about 15 years ago. And it has gone a great deal of attention in the world of time series analysis. Now, there have been numerous papers written on SACS and, and the abilities of SACS go very far beyond the technique that I'm talking about here. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll provide a link to where the research is available on SACS and you can go download all of the things that there are available on that. There's a great deal. Um, A symbol that's created by the SACS algorithm is called a SACS word. And it's defined by a SACS alphabet, which we can think of as just a sequence of letters, say A, B, C, and a length, which is the number of letters, which correspond exactly to the data boxes in the piecewise aggregate approximation that we talked about in normalizing time series. Now, the size of the alphabet is typically small. I mentioned A, B, C. That, that three-letter SACS word is actually a fairly common one that we use for anomaly detection. Um, keep it, keeping the size of the alphabet small keeps the size of the finite symbol space small, which means this algorithm remains practical. Um, when we write out a description of a sax word, we typically use a string like A, B, C, D, or something like that. Now, the sax letter, they don't have to be letters. There's nothing about the algorithm that requires them to be letters. And in fact, implementations typically use very small integers based in zero. And, but when, it's traditional that when we represent a sax word textually, we represent it as letters based in A. Well, to build a, a, a sax word, is a fairly simple algorithm. I convert the time series window to a PAA and I z-normalize it. A little bit of magic there, we'll get to that in a second. Um, I then compute the Sachs letter by dividing the standard normal distribution into K regions where K is the number of Sachs letters that I have. And then I assign each component of the, PA, the normalized PAA a letter from, from the Sachs alphabet corresponding to what component of the standard normal di distribution it was. Don't worry, there'll be a picture in just a second. <laughs> and then I repeat this for each value of the PAA yields a SACS word with a equivalent link to the PAA. And there's the picture I was talking about. And in this we take a, a, a PAA consisting of eight components and convert it into a SACS letter, a, a SACS word, each component of which is three SACS letters uh, of length eight. Um, it takes linear time to do this once you have computed the cuts for dividing the standard normal di distribution. Um, we provide source code to do this, and at the end I'll link to Similarity's open source uh, uh, repository on GitHub, and you can download code to do exactly this. Um, the description here is probably not sufficient to implement it. Now, you may have noticed something, and that is that we z-normalized that, um, that uh, PAA, and we lost some information when we did that. Uh, in particular, we lost information about the magnitude, the standard deviation, and the slope. Um, we lose information on the slope because we so reduced the resolution by converting to a Sachs letter. Um, they can be encoded in the Sachs word, and uh, the magnitude or the standard deviation can be uh, z-normalized over the entire space of, this, of, the, of the time series and then divided into Sachs letters exactly the same way. And the slope can be divided into 180 degrees and assigned to any number of letters there, which um, these things allow you to encode more information. Now, whether or not you want to encode that information depends on your application. And in many applications, you actually want to remove magnitude information. The standard deviation information, perhaps you want to include. Now, the interesting stuff, computing the anomaly. 
we need a data structure, and it can be on any number of things, that uses the SACS word as an index and stores the number of times I've seen each SACS word as well as the total number of windows I've seen. And because our SACS words are drawn from a finite symbol space, we know the total number of possible SACS words. And so we can use tries, which are fast, or we can convert the SACS word into a number and use it as an array index. Now, this requires some exponentiation. And in our small devices, that's probably what we want to do. It's simple multiplication uh, rather than using a recursive data structure. And then when we, we convert the window to a SAX word, we look up the current count for that SAX word and increment it. So it's at least one, important for the math. And then we compute a metric which describes how anomalous that window is by using three values, the total number of windows, the number of instances of this SAX word, and the size of the finite symbol space of SAX words. And then we compute the result of the metric with a predetermined threshold to decide whether or not this window is anomalous. And then this procedure is repeated for constantly incoming time series. The metric. The three values don't really tell us anything. We need to combine them to get some kind of statistical measure of how anomalous we think this thing is. And we want a few properties. We may not be able to get all of them. It should discriminate in the sense that not everything is an anomaly or normal. There are gradations in between. And I want to be able to slide a window that, that allows for more anomalies or less anomalies. It should be easy to compute. As I mentioned earlier, putting these things on edge devices that are very small is a, it was a goal for us. And a lot of times these small computers don't have floating point units. They don't have even floating point libraries. And doing complex mathematics may not be feasible in the small space. And last, <clears throat> the metric should reflect the real world. It should, um, it should be something that you can understand as being meaningful. We don't always get all of these. The first thing you might think of as using for a metric is a p-value. Uh, it gives you a, the probability of having seen something so small, a number so small, which would tell you the probability of it being an anomaly. And, um, and that's a connection in the real world. Um, they have two problems. One, you're drawing a p-value from the binomial distribution here which requires some fairly heavy math to compute. And the other thing is, is that when you get the large numbers that actually yield statistical significance in this sort of thing, and as you read time windows in over time, the p-values tend to, to, to normalize towards zero and one. And so if it's any sort of anomaly at all, the p-value is zero and you can't discriminate between them. And that kind of sets a hard criterion for an anomaly, which essentially prevents you from setting your own criterion for an anomaly. The log likelihood ratio works out a little better. Um, you can scale it to between negative one and one so that it's not so large. And reversing the sign actually gives you an anomaly value. You, you get a number that, that says it's this anomalous. Um, it's a little difficult to relate to the real world once you've done all this munging of it. Um, but it can be computed using nothing more complicated than a logarithm. And so it, uh, it does require a floating point library to, to, to compute the logarithm, or at least good tables. And, um, but more importantly, it accounts for the significance of the data. That is, as, as you get more samples, it first sees things as being not anomalous at all, and then slowly starts bringing them in and starts discriminating as it learns what normal is. There's a third possibility, and actually there are many, many more possibilities. There's a third that we'll examine, which is the rate ratio, which is just the number of times more likely the event was, was observed to have occurred than would have been predicted by random chance. 
And if you use this in its native form, numbers between zero and one are anomalous, with zero being most anomalous. And numbers between one and infinity are least anomalous or most normal. As they get larger, they get more normal. You can do a little bit of math of this to arrange it, but <clears throat> the interesting thing about this is it doesn't require math harder than division and is easy to compute with fixed point numbers in small devices. It still gives you a number which reflects the real world, and but it doesn't as well account for significance. Um, and you have to account for it by some other means, like uh, only reporting something as an anomaly after you've seen it a few times. And while we're big believers in SACS, it may not always be the best way to reduce a window to a symbol. Um, it reduces the resolution equally across all its members. And this means that tiny but important variations get lost. And where you might see this is in the analysis of an EKG, where a slightly different heartbeat is the difference between you're fine and you're about to have a heart attack. Um, for things that have this sort of thing, self-organizing maps are perhaps a better choice. They also reduce time series or any other sort of vector to a symbol, and they, can, they encode magnitude directly, so you don't have to do these kind of tricks to encode magnitude, and they don't require that the input PAA, you still need to reduce it to a PAA because the, the, the self-organizing map requires a fixed size vector that comes into it, but it can encode magnitude directly because it doesn't have to be C-normalized. Um, a self-organizing map is a grid of vectors which you can think of as weights or even more appropriately prototypes. And um, the, the, the self-organizing map algorithm adjusts the weights according to a training set so that it organizes into clusters which, uh, which progress across the grid in an organized manner. Um, and to operate it, what I do is I take a, 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 a time series window vector derived from, uh, as a PAA and I compare it to each of the prototypes and I measure it with a distance, typically a Euclidean distance, although other distance metrics are okay. Um, and the closest one wins and the coordinates of that grid square are the symbol. Um, once I do that, as you'll notice, I still have, I still have the, uh, the three values that I need to compute the metric. I can use this to predict events. Uh, I look for the correlation between symbols representing time series windows and events that happen in the future. And this can use to categorize events according to what we call an event signature. An event signature implies an outcome at a particular time index. A concrete example of this uses the smart data on hard drives. We, we used 53 sensors on, on hard drives to test for anomalies and predict failures. The information was from nearly 400 drives, was used to train the anomaly detector, and once it was trained, the system used, identified the event signatures for failure. Um, and we used this then to predict failure, and this is a picture of what we got out of it. Um, this is two different failures, and you can see that one, there are different sensors that were, that were identified as being anomalous, and these are the anomalous values. Some of them look similar, some of them look different. We used Similarity's correlation engine to correlate this with future events which correlated to failure, and we were actually able to estimate the time until failure of the hard drive using this technique. Okay, credit. This technique is similar but not identical to the Tarzan methodology outlined by Dr. Eamon Kyo and Dr. Jessica Lynn in 2005. Uh, th their, their work on SACS is available at this URL. And um, self-organizing maps were invented in 1985 by Tiva Cohen, and he maintains a web page on, um, on the current research into self-organizing maps. I would highly recommend his book. It's about this thick and uh, tells you everything you would ever want to know about it. We have source code available and an implementation of SACS as suitable for using with the techniques described here is available at those coordinates.
and thank you. Thank you, right? Next up.